Former President Trump says the conflicts in the Middle East could escalate into, quote, the third world war if he loses the election. Trump made the remarks at his Mar-a-Lago resort as he met with Israel's prime minister, Bibi Netanyahu. The Republican presidential nominee appears to be taking on Vice President Kamala Harris in November after President Biden announced he would not run for re-election. Trump told reporters that hopefully he wins the election because if not, quote, you're going to end up with major wars in the Middle East and maybe a third world war. He added, quote, you are closer to a third world war right now than at any time since the second world war. Both Harris and Trump met with Netanyahu this week while he was in the U.S. I do want to talk about that and the latest developments out of the Middle East. So let's bring in a friend of the show here, Dr. Asaf Ramorowski, the executive director of Scholars for Peace in the Middle East. Thank you so much, as always, for taking the time to be here with us. Thank you, as always, for having me. All right, so first off, I do want to ask you about those comments that Trump did make to reporters as he was meeting with Netanyahu about the, quote, third world war. What do you make of all of that? Well, look, we are in a uh, we are in the height of the presidential campaign. I think that the Middle East is always going to be a volatile state. Uh, It is true that I I do believe that we are heading into a bunch, a a series of cycles, to be clear, uh, as far as where Israel is going with these war on several fronts. And all of this really, you know, as we've spoken in the past, relates to the larger axis of Iran. whether or not and what Trump will do when it comes to dealing with the Iranians, obviously we can only base it on his past actions. Uh, positively, he of course uh, cut off and you know the the deal the 2015 JCPOA and turned that around. There was a little bit more deterrence, but the Middle East is evolving, and again, it's not you know necessarily clear that whether or not that he will be in office or Harris, uh, how that will impact. Uh, necessarily, of course, it will impact U.S. actions as far as our allies. That being said, the wars in the region, I think, are going to continue independent of who is in the White House. I think the bigger question relates to the fact is who is going to give the most amount of deterrence uh, as it relates to U.S. stance in the region at large. And, And that, I think, is something that we need to restore. Um, My hope is, of course, that we have a much stronger uh, deterrence when it comes to our adversaries uh, in the region, especially when it comes to Iran. And there needs to be serious consequences. So at that end, uh, we need a much stronger stance. And Trump has shown that he's been extremely positive on that. Uh, yet to be seen. Again, he also had uh, was not happy with Netanyahu when Netanyahu congratulated Biden uh, when he was elected. So yet to be seen. Again, we're in the midst of this larger uh, campaign. Uh, a lot can happen between now and November. What is similar to both candidates, I, w- I would say, and that has come out from both Harris and from Trump, is that they do want to see an end or at least a, a game plan for what, what the day after tomorrow looks like. Uh, and that is consistent with both parties. And I think that the Israelis need to figure out exactly how they want to present that and what that will look like. And I want to talk about that because the day before Trump met with Netanyahu, he said to his supporters that Israel needed to quickly finish up the war. And then after meeting with Netanyahu, Kamala Harris said basically the same thing. And we know Netanyahu did get pretty upset with Harris for her comments, saying that it's possible this could impact the ceasefire hostage release deal in some way. One of these two people could be the next U.S. president. So is that concerning for Israel and for Netanyahu that they are making essentially the same comment? Well, it's definitely concerning to Israel and and they need the United States. They need the U.S. as a relationship to work. The historically speaking, the root cause and the centerpiece of U.S. Israel relations has been based on bipartisan ties. Uh, Clearly, that's not been easy uh, to maintain over the past few years. And I would argue even that uh, since Obama was in office, uh, there was a lot of an erosion uh, of airing the dirty laundry. The crux of, or really the centerpiece of how the U.S. Israel relationship works has been based on what is known in foreign policy as the no daylight concept, the idea that allies could have grievances, they could have issues, but they can work them out in house. 
Uh, over the past few years, we've seen presidents, uh, including Obama, including Biden, and now Harris, uh, you know, in her candidacy, you know, the presumptive nominee, are airing a lot of dirty laundry on the Israelis with the idea of putting out pressure. Again, it's not only been consistent to Democrats, Republicans have also had uh, airing dirty laundry as a way to put on pressure on the Israelis. Uh, you know, again, it depends on the personality, the tact, and the psychology that plays out into all of this. Uh, what upset Netanyahu and Harris's comments in particular was the fact that she focused a great deal on the suffering of the civilian population without taking into consideration exactly what's going on as far as the hostages, as far as exactly what the Israelis are doing, and the steps that they've been taking serious steps to maintain the integrity of the civilian population. That caught Netanyahu off guard, and that's where a lot of the upset came from, uh, from the Netanyahu camp following her remarks. I do want to pop this video up on the screen right here. It's been circulating over the past several days because we saw fires that were set to American flags, vandalism to monuments there in D.C., during Netanyahu's trip. Does that say anything about the state, the current state here, of the U.S.-Israel relationship? Oh, it clearly does. I mean, these kind of symbols, which is, again, uh, horrific, and there needs to be serious consequences. This is exactly what we saw at the end of the uh, spring semester on American college campuses. You are seeing here flying of flags of PLO flags, Hamas flags, actual terrorist flags flown in front of Union Square, in front of, in front of, in front of Union Station, uh, where they are burning American flags. Uh, these are anarchists. Uh, they're anti-American. They're anti-Semitic. Uh, and there needs to be serious consequences to all this kind of activity squashing this down. I mean, this should not be happening any way, shape, or form. Uh, but it is quite telling about the sentiment uh, and the reality of the progressive flank of the Democratic Party, which they are looking towards Harris to uphold, uh, and, and the kind of reaction that they're seeing in Washington and the way that they have depicted and seen Benjamin Netanyahu. There is no... Uh, whatsoever excuse for this kind of behavior. And both parties should want to crack down on this kind of active terrorism. The groups that are out there, including groups like the American Muslims for Palestine, Code Pink, uh, you know, ceasefire groups and others, they have been the same kind of individuals that were involved in the encampments. And to my mind, when these patterns repeat themselves, we're going to see a lot more of this as we go into uh, the DNC in Chicago and the plans that are going to lay out there uh, in less than a month uh, with the same kind of activism. And this needs to be stopped. Talking a little bit more about the potential for a ceasefire hostage release deal, this is a topic that you and I have discussed, I would say, quite a bit over the last several months, especially, of course, since October 7th itself. So my question for you right now, we know that Israeli media, many of the different outlets there are reporting that the ceasefire deal is once again in jeopardy, so to speak, because of new demands that are being placed by Netanyahu. Do we know if that's really the case? And do we have any idea what those demands could actually be not clear yet there's a lot of there's a lot of talk about what's coming in and out what has been clear is that the hostage bodies that were found now were actually found in the tunnels in the area of the safe zones where the civilian population was told to go to so clearly uh they are the integrity of those areas and the fact that hamas has been still controlling the area is still taking place uh, the, as we speak, the IDF is now in Gaza, in the areas of Han Yunus, uh, an area that they have been before, but going back to, again, as the IDF continues to move along into Gaza, even the areas that they have cleansed are still rearming themselves. Uh, what is clear in the demand has been from Netanyahu, which I think is the ongoing demand, is maintaining the security and the safety of what is known as the Philadelphia route. That Philadelphia route is exactly the border and where the tunnels are with the Egyptians. And so you got to maintain that security. And the other demand that has come out of the Netanyahu uh, and his people was basically, again, to my point before, is how do you maintain the fact that there will not be rearmament 
of the northern part of Gaza as the Israelis go in and they continue to uh, fight these areas and these tunnels and where Hamas is located with the sole goal, of course, of trying to rescue hostages and deal with the same and deal with the military concerns that they've had all along as rockets continue to come in and they're finding more and more bodies, which again is the psychological warfare and the main concern that the hostage families have, that time is indeed at the essence. Uh, and this kind of, uh, that the more and more time goes by, the more they are at risk of not being able to bring their family, their loved ones uh, alive and safe. And that's a really psychological uh, mind game that they're playing with the Israelis. And Hamas knows that. This is Hamas's lifeline, uh, and this is their life insurance, and they, are, they, they have time on their side, whereas the families, here we are almost nine months and almost 10 months into the war itself, uh, and we're, they want they have not seen resolution for what is a critical uh, and an emotional and a stressful issue for Israeli society at large, but in particular to the hostage families. I want to ask you what might seem like kind of a random question, but as you know, the Olympics are now going on. So in ancient Greece, when the Olympic Games did take place, we know that all worldwide conflict was supposed to come to an end, any kind of armed conflict during the time of the games. And the UN chief has called for that to happen here over in Gaza between Israel and Hamas. My question, though, is that in any way realistic? It's idealistic. I would like to think so. I mean, you know, what is telling for the Israelis that these games are, of course, on the anniversary of the 1972 Munich elections, where you had, again, hostage takeover during the Olympics. You had Black September, an affiliate of the PLO, uh, killing Israeli athletes. That has been a traumatic and a tragic event that keeps in the minds of Israelis. Uh, one of the things that was not a, that the Olympic team uh, was not a, the Israeli Olympic team was not allowed to wear were hostage pins. So you did see that the swim team uh, were able to, uh, you know, in one of their in one of their uh, exercises, uh, spell out, bring home the hostages. Uh, I think that the Olympics are indeed a symbolic. Uh, and symbolism that you can have uh, a farewell to arms and coming together and whatnot. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, you've also seen attacks at the Paris train station. You've seen some anti uh, significant growth of anti Semitism in Europe. So while all the games are taking place and the idealism that we would like to have happen going back to ancient Greece. Um, politics and populism and radicalism are indeed driving a lot of the tenor, uh, even at the Olympic Games.